Okay, great. So um, I thought today I'll go over <clears throat> maybe some, I don't know, some Python code stuff that uh, can be useful when you're trying to, uh, you know, break up some bits of data, you want to apply a function or things like that. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll take a look. Um, so I don't know if we formally covered defining your own function, but um, you use this keyword DEF for define, and then you, uh, you give it the function name, and then uh, you give it some parentheses to kind of let Python know you're de making a function, and then you put in a colon, okay? So, <clears throat> so here I'm making a function called say hello, and all it does is it prints out hello, okay? And the way Python knows that certain lines of code belong to a function is based on indentation, okay? So as soon as the indenting is done, then Python knows the code has, the, the function has finished def being defined. So like in R, you have curly braces to kind of indicate the start and the, the end. Um, we don't have that. It's just, you have a colon to say like, here's the code, it's starting, and then you have to use indentation. And if you don't use indentation, like, it's gonna say, I expected an in indented block, yeah. Is it exactly like one tab, or it could be like? Oh, it doesn't matter, okay. it's just like, I think, here, I think I can have this even. Oh, maybe it'll get upset. Expected, unexpected, indent. Okay. So if I go to in, so if it's at the same level, it's okay. But it says uh, unindent doesn't match outer indentation level. So, so it it it's um, yeah. I guess if you have different different levels of indentation, it, it's going to get angry. <clears throat> okay. Um, but yeah, if I do this, then um, this is just its own line. So I should say hello and hi, and I don't know why this keeps showing up in red. It looks, it looks, there we go. <laughs> so say hello, and you know, calling say hello again. <clears throat> so this is its own line and it's run, and it says hi, but it's not part of the say hello function, right? Is, is that okay? All right, and then, um, and over here, so I haven't given it like a return thing. So print doesn't return a value. Well, it returns none, okay? I should say print returns none. And so when I, uh, if I try to say, um, if I call x on say hello, all right, then, um, then it runs the, uh, the function and it prints out hello. And then if I ask, you know, what is the value of x, it tells me it's none, okay? And so if you want, um, if you want to have a function that's going to return values, you have to use uh, the keyword return, okay? So in this case, I'm defining a function called add1, and it, it takes in an argument x, and what it will do is it will return x plus 1, okay? So, um, so x is equal to add one to five. So uh, this calls the function and assigns the return value to x, right? <coughs> and then when we print out what x is, it says it takes on the value six. 
Okay, over here, um, I didn't use the word return. Okay, so, uh, so I've created a function called bad add one, which is a function of y. And it calculates y plus 1, but it doesn't do anything with it. And then it prints out the value y plus 1. Okay. So when I take y and I say, um, and I take bad add 1 of 6 and assign it to y, it prints out 7, but that's only because it's running the print y plus 1 command. Okay. However, if we ask what is the value of y at that instance, y is equal to none because it took the uh, the function uh, and you know its last thing it, that it runs is print, which is going to return none here, and so it takes the value none and assigns it to y. So it prints out seven, but the value of y is uh, none has been assi assigned to the value of y. Okay, so, does that make sense right here? All right. And then over here, I've got another function called b add one, and um, and here I have the keyword return. It's going to return y plus one, and then after y plus one, um, there's the uh, it, it's it's calling for print y plus one. Okay, and when I execute that b add one six and assign it to z. As soon as it hits the return, the function quits. So much like R, as soon as it hits the return, it's not going to run any more code. It's done. The function's done. It's fulfilled its purpose in life. And um, and whatever stuff it had, you still had written in the, the function is not going to get executed because it, it, it has returned its value. But then, um, you know, in this case, when we call, you know, what is the value of Z? it does indeed um, have the value y plus 1. All right. All right. Is this okay? Um, defining functions. So, uh, so we use the word def, the name, and then parentheses colon. Okay? And then if you, know, if you want multiple arguments, <coughs> you can list them all inside the definition of the function. Okay, um, you are able to return multiple values uh, via a tuple, okay? And so here I'm defining a function called favorites, and it doesn't take in any arguments, and it's just when, uh, when you call favorites, it's going to return a tuple, uh, and, you know, a tuple is kind of like a list, except it's not mutable, and... Uh, so you can have mixed value types in here, okay? Uh, here I've got something called the doc string. If you use tri you use triple quotes, often you'll put triple quotes immediately after the definition of the function, and this is it's supposed to be a description of what the function is supposed to do, and um, and basically after you define a function, if uh, if you call for uh, if you do question mark on the name of the function, then it will bring up kind of the help, right? <clears throat> and then the doc string will be uh, the description that you write in there, right? And, and the doc string can be multiple things, right? So it returns a tuple of some of my favorite things, you know, my favorite color is red, and I like statistics, okay? And so, um, and when you when you call for help on favorites, it brings up the help, and it and everything that you write in your doc string uh, appears there. Okay. All right, and then um, and so anyway, uh, just inside the, the this function barely does anything, but it's just to show that you know it's going to return a tuple. So I have x assigned to the string uh, or the <laughs> string red is assigned to x, the string statistics is assigned to y, and the integer 2011 is assigned to z. And then I define a tuple called my tuple, and it's just parentheses x, y, z. I mean, I could just put this directly 
in here for return my tuple. So instead of return my tuple, I could just return parentheses x, y, z. So that, that's totally fine as well. And then when you call the function, it returns a tuple, indeed. Okay, you get red statistics 2011. All right. And then, um, and because it returns a tuple, then you can kind of unpack the tuple into different values. So you can say, uh, I want the results of favorites, which favorites is going to return a tuple of length three. Uh, you can unpack that into ABC. So kind of like um, when we did, uh, uh, what is it, train test split. Train test split, you provide it um, a series of arrays, and then it's going to return back twice as many things, right? So if you give it two arrays, it'll return back four values. And you, 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 know, you capture those as x train, x test, y train, y test, and something like that. It's kind of like that. Here, we can say, you know, I want to assign a, b, and c equal to those favorites. And then, you know, you can then take each of those values and, and do whatever you need to do with it. So, see so here we've got um, the favorites. And we say, uh, assign the output of favorites to a, b, and c. And then you ask, you know, what's... What is A? A is red. What is B? B is statistics. And what is C? C is 2011. <clears throat> okay. If, um, if you try to unpack it and you give it the wrong number of values to assign, it's going to kick back an error. So I say D, E, F, G. So there's four values, but the function only returns a tuple of three. So it kicks back an error. It says uh, not enough values to un unpack. Ex expected four. It got three. Um, likewise, if you give it too few, DE, it's going to say too many values to unpack. We, you know, it expected two, but we got, gave it three. So it's just when, it, when it's just right, no problem. When you give it too many or too few, it's going gonna, it's gonna to complain for, uh, for two <coughs> returning values. So th this is kind of a nice, nice thing that R is not able to do, right? In R, you always had to package everything into a single object and so you'd often just create a list that contains everything and then you can you'd have to store the list into some object and then you know use dollar sign notation to pull the pull the things out of the list uh, and with uh, with Python you can you can just return multiple values directly so that that's nice okay um, anytime we start def defining functions and then we have to start talking about scope and about um, you know the uh, the environment in which our uh, variables exist and where they interact and things like that right so you know you know similar to our you know values defined in a function don't interact with the global environment unless we explicitly tell them to do so okay so here I'm defining X is equal to 4 so X is 4 in the global environment Okay, we're going to define a function called modify. Here, uh, it's a function of a, and we're going to say x is equal to a plus 5. And when we do this, this x here exists only in the scope of this function. Okay, so this x exists only in this function, and then we're going to return x. And so um, I call modify 4, and then... Uh, it returns 4 plus 5, x becomes 9, and it's going to return 9, and so modify 4 is 9. Okay, it prints out 9. Okay, but then if I ask what is x in the global environment, x in the global environment is still 4. So that's, that's fine, right? <coughs> this is, uh, I, I, I guess I'm assuming everybody's okay with how the interaction works in R, and it's it's pretty similar. So I'm hoping this is not too surprising here. Um, here, actually, it it could be helpful. Let me um, we'll create another function. All right, so this will be define. Um, uh, no, no, no. We'll call look for. 
look for x, all right, and this will be a function of a, all right, and then we'll say um, y is equal to x plus a, all right, so x is not defined inside the function, and we'll return y. Okay, and then we'll, we'll call the function look for x where uh, a is 10. Okay, and so when, when you do this, <coughs> indeed it takes 10, and then um, x does not exist inside the local environment, and so it searches the global environment, right? x does not exist inside this scope, so it searches the higher scope, global, okay, and uses that x. Um, we'll call look for x2, <coughs> and so here I will define x as 2 inside the function. And then, so if I call look for x2 on 10, what will this return? This will return 12, right? So this time, x does exist in this scope, so it uses the value 2. This is not surprising, right? This is expected expected behavior based on our understanding of scope in R, okay? So it's, uh, it's similar, okay? If, um, but we don't have any kind of super assignment in, um, there's no, uh, no super assignment operator in, um, in Python. Instead, we have keywords. There's global and then there's non-local. And I didn't, I didn't bother writing any, um, any functions using non-local. But here, we've got uh, modify global. Okay, I'm define, defining a function called modify global. And here, I call global x. And so when I use the keyword global, here, this is going to tell, um, tell R that, uh, that this val value x is going to be the same x that's in the global environment. So when I modify x, here, um, I want it to change the uh, the x in the uh, in the global environment. Okay, so when I call uh, modify global on um, here, it's going to take the global value of x, add fifty to it, and store that to x, and then it'll return x. So here I've got modify global four, it returns fifty four, and then when I print x in the global environment, it it has the value fifty four. And then, yeah, you could have functions nested inside other functions, and, and I know we did this in uh, 102a. Uh, we had all sorts of tricky things going on. Um, and you could use the uh, keyword non-local to define, uh, to say, you know, use the, uh, the va variable that's in the higher scope, the non-local scope, but not necessarily the global scope, the global environment, okay? Um, but I don't know. <clears throat> I didn't. I didn't bother writing an example there. I guess I could, uh, but I'm. I'm guessing you probably won't write too many functions nested inside of each other. But who knows? Maybe. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we've got for loops and uh, and I think you know for loops and while loops were covered in you know one of your data camp courses like the uh, the intermediate data camp or something um, and uh, and you can run a for loop over uh, you know lots of things that you know we call them iterables okay and so probably you know your most common one will be like a list or a numpy array or something like that and so, you know, here I'm creating a list, 
um, with just colors, red, orange, yellow, and green, just string elements, okay? And then to, uh, to run a for loop, you say for, and then you, uh, you name the item, item and L, and then it's gonna go through and uh, it's gonna iterate <coughs> and use the, uh, you know, whatever object is in the, the list. And so here I'm just saying, take the item, um, append a exclamation point because you're excited and, uh, and print that out, okay? And so this is very simple. For item in L, print item plus exclamation point, and it says red, orange, yellow, green, just like that. Um, okay, that's that's not surprising. Um, if instead of calling the item directly, and you wanted to, um, you know, use an index, you could do that. You can say for I. In, uh, and then you would create a range object. Range is, um, you know, it starts at zero and ends at, uh, and produces a, a range of length, of, you know, whatever number you provide it. So here I say range length L. So length L is four, and so this is equivalent, equivalent to um, I in range four, okay? And range four is basically zero, one, two, three. Okay, and then subset the list. L bracket I will uh, will subset the list, and then append the uh, the exclamation point, and we get red, orange, yellow, green. Same same thing, right? Just a closer inspection on the uh, the range object. When you ask to print the range object itself, it's going to return a range object. Okay. If you want to see the numbers in the range object, then you've got to throw the range object into a list or an array or something, some kind of uh, <clears throat> some kind of container, and then you'll get the values zero, one, two, three. Okay. So the range object itself is not a list. You have to throw it into a list, and then it will be turned into these numbers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> NumPy arrays are also iterable uh, in much the same way we would expect. So here I've got n is a NumPy uh, array range 4, okay, and that's uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, okay. And we distinguish it from a list because the list has commas and then the NumPy array does not. And then we just say, you know, for i and n, so n being this array, we're going to just print i times 10 and we get 0, 10, 20, 30, okay? So that's that's no surprise, these, uh, these four loops here. Uh, interesting enough is uh, strings themselves are iterable, and when you iterate over a string, each letter in the string is the element, okay? Or each element is, is the letter. So here I've got, for A, in the uh, the string hi there exclamation point, I'm asking it to print a dot upper. Okay, so upper being the method that takes a string object and returns the uppercase version of it, and so uh, so it, and it prints it off. And when it, when you print, it creates a new line each time. <coughs> so it's going to capitalize, you know, every single letter there. Okay, and it and it does the space and it does the exclamation point as well. Obviously not. There's no uppercase version of a, a space or exclamation point. But, but so you have that. So you've got um, strings are iterable, okay? And then we have a dictionary. So here I've got some dictionary D. Dictionaries are defined using curly braces, and then uh, they consist of key and value pairs, okay? So you've got California colon Sacramento, Texas colon Austin, New York colon Albany, <coughs> being um, kind of the state and capital. And then uh, if you want to iterate over a dictionary, you have to say for key comma value or, you know, whatever words you want to use, okay, basically A comma B because each dictionary item consists of two things. And then you can throw that into whatever function you want to perform. So here I'm just saying, I'm just creating a string that says the capital of the key <coughs> space is 
the val uh, value, which in this case is the uh, the uh, the city. That's the, uh, the thing. Okay, you've got to uh, make sure you use um, the dictionary dot items method. Okay, otherwise it will uh, um, it won't work. Okay, so the uh, you got to tell it that you want the um, the dictionary dot items. Okay. Because uh, when you ask to print D itself, it's going to be this dictionary. And D.items <coughs> is basically a list of tuples that can then be unpacked into key and value. Okay, So you've got, um, so when you do D.items, it becomes <coughs> a list of tuples, and then the tuples can be unpacked into the, uh, the values <coughs> key, key and value. Okay, those variables and, and allows you to uh, to do that. Okay. All right. There's a there's another handy thing called uh, zipping. Let me okay. So uh, zipping takes basically some lists. And then you'll zip them together into something called a zip, a zip object, and it's it's kind of like un, the opposite of unpacking a dictionary. So here we took the dictionary and and we unpacked them into <coughs> keys and values. And here it's like I'm taking keys and values and I'm going to zip them together. All right. And so here I'll do uh, I zip states in caps here. So I've got Oregon, Washington, Ohio, Salem, Olympia, Columbus. And then I zip them together, and if I say, what is Z, it's going to tell me it's a zip object. Oh, we have a question. Yeah, when you zip the two lists, do they have to be They technically don't. Like, you can have, um, um, like, it, it'll run, mm -hmm. but then um, when you uh, un unpack them, the... Uh, the thing that is not paired uh, gets lost or, or something happens. Um, let me just see. So here if I do uh, California, so here it goes here, but if I cut one of this off here, the uh, the one that that's not paired up kind of gets lost. Okay? So, um, Generally, you want to have things that are the, the same length, okay? Um, yeah, let me oh, let me see. Zipping objects or zipping lists of different length. How does it... okay? All right. Well, people are asking questions like they wanted to repeat and stuff, and uh, yeah. Normally, it just kind of throws. Away, I think it just throws away the ones that aren't matched. Okay. Um, so when you zip it, you get a zip object. Okay. So here I'm saying z is equal to zip, and we're zipping this uh, the two list states and caps, <clears throat> and I get this zip object. Which, you know, what are you supposed to do with that? And if you want to unpack the zip object you can use print star z, okay? And star z will unpack it uh, into, into these tuples, okay? But the funny thing about a zip object is that once you unpack it, or once you like turn the zip object into something else, it, uh, it, like, it, it takes those things out of the zip, okay? And so, if I say, all right, I, won't, um, I still have the same zip object, but when I at, try to unpack it again, it returns nothing. It, it, it's empty because it has it, it sees itself as having unpacked the zip, and so there, there's nothing left. Okay. Um, if you want to like kind of store store the uh, the zip object, okay. So here I'm gonna. Uh, recreate my zip zip object and then I'm going to take 
um, the zip object z and throw it into a list. And I'm going to call this zl. Right? And then when I do that, now I have zl as this uh, list of list of tuples, okay? And then if I ask, you know, what's left in uh, the zip object, the zip object is, is empty again, okay? Um, <clears throat> now that I have a list of tuples, I can unpack it, and I can um, unpack it to value one and value two in zip list, and, uh, and print this out this way. Print the capital of value one, value two is value two, okay? And so this is just kind of like uh, yeah, unpacking the, uh, the list, okay? Um, so you can, you can take a zip object and throw it into a list and you'll get a list of tuples. Or you can take a zip object and throw it into a dictionary and you'll get a uh, list of key, key value pairs, okay? And so here, um, I take the zip, I throw it into the dictionary, and again, when, once you throw it into the dictionary, the zip object Z itself will, will be empty. Okay, so here um, I do this, and then um, and so now I've got a dictionary. We can tell it's a dictionary because it's got the curly braces and the colons. <coughs> and then um, just like having um, the previous iterables, uh, we can unpack the dictionary by saying for key comma value, and uh, and then we you know, do whatever we want to do with those values, okay? Yeah, using zip dictionary dot items parentheses. Okay. I believe, uh, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. All right, and then let's do nums equal to uh, one, two, and three. And I think I can zip all three of these things together. Okay, so you can zip multiple lists. And then if I say print star z, okay, then we get um, tuples like this. And again, if I, if I try to print it again uh, after unpacking it, it it's gone. Um, I can run this and then um, throw z list two into uh, list z and print z list two and we'll get that. <clears throat> Just uh, this is expected. I don't think we can do this if I create a zip. I don't think I can throw this into a dictionary. I think it'll complain because it's got three terms. Um, but I haven't tried this. Yeah. Um, so here I've got, I zipped up three lists together and I'm trying to throw it into a dictionary <coughs> and it, it says you can't do that because, you know, the dictionary consists of key, key value pairs and here we're giving it a list, um, you know, tuples of length three. <coughs> so it doesn't know what to do. Tuples of length three can stay as tuples and you can create a list of that, but you can't, you can't throw it into a dictionary. Okay, is that good? Sure. <laughs> All right, um, and then the last, uh, last thing we'll take a look at today is called list comprehensions. And these things are really cool. This is, kind, they're kind of like um, Python's version of an apply function, okay? Except, so in R you had something called lapply where you feed it a list and it returns a list, right? You take a list, you apply a function to every item in that list, and then it, re it will return a list of whatever the result of that function is, okay? And a list comprehension is kind of like Python's version of an lapply, okay? So, so if you want, the results of a loop to be stored in a list, uh, it makes sense to use a list comprehension. So here, here's a, a loop method. So here I'm, I have a list of colors, red, orange, yellow, and green. And I want to uh, store the results in this 
uh, <coughs> list called results. And so I define, I create an empty list by doing um, single brackets, okay, empty brackets. And then we say for item and L, so for each of these things, um, take the results list and append, and then we're going to append item plus an exclamation point, okay? And so when I run that, I get, you know, red exclamation, red, orange exclamation, yellow exclamation, green exclamation, okay? Um, if you're coming from R, you might be tempted to do something like this, where uh, you've got an empty list, results B, and then you say for I in this range object, I in, you know, 0 through 4, um, you know, store the output <coughs> of L sub I plus exclamation point into results B, okay? And, um, and if you do this, you're going to get uh, an index out of range, okay? So you, you have to chain, you know, make sure your list is of length four first so that you don't go out of range there, okay? If, if the, uh, the list itself <coughs> um, what wasn't, um, you know, empty, then this could work. But if you just start off with an empty list and then you say, you know, subset it to index i, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you an error. Okay, um, but going back to uh, this thing, instead of taking each uh, each thing and appending it to our empty list, we can just say, what is it that you want? You want item plus exclamation point. This is what we want to store. And then we give it basically almost like the, uh, the instructions for a for loop. You say for item in L, okay? And you throw that into... Um, <clears throat> list brackets, okay? So you put inside the list brackets, you say, uh, this is what I want to store, item plus exclamation for each item in L, okay? And when you do that, you get uh, results two is going to be a list uh, with exactly what you want, okay? So you didn't, you don't even have to write a for loop, you just uh, do something called a list comprehension. So it's applying basically this function, which is item plus exclamation point for each item in here. Okay, and, uh, and it's, it's very quick, and so uh, it works for dictionaries also, okay, so here I've got the dictionary um, with the key values, right, California, Sacramento, and, and things like that, and then so here I, I want to uh, capture <coughs> a bunch of strings in this text uh, list called text, and uh, the thing I'm going to capture is going to be the capital of, and then we take key is plus is plus value, okay? And then and then we just give it basically as if the uh, the top part of a for loop for key comma value in d dot items, okay? So this will unpack the dictionary um, into key value pairs, and then uh, it stores the output of whatever this function is into our <coughs> list, and we get uh, a list of strings, which is... I don't know. This is kind of cool. <laughs> All right, list list comprehensions. They're they're very uh, very useful. Okay, in in the same way that L apply is very useful in R, uh, list comprehension is very useful. There there's another function called map, which is uh, which is similar, um, and works and pretty much does the same thing as a list comprehension. But um, list comprehensions are kind of the uh, expected norm. Okay, you, you can look up a function called map, which does almost the same thing and, and writes it in kind of more of a traditional function uh, form, but the, the list comprehension is kind of the norm in Python. Okay, you're even allowed to have conditions in your list comprehension. So, so here I've got um, the iterable range 0, 10, which goes from 0 to 9, right? <laughs> And then, basically, I just want to store the value d. So this is this is the expression I want to store. I just want to store d for uh, d in this range, and then I can apply a condition. And this then only the values that fulfill this condition will be stored into uh, the resulting list. So here it says if d um, percent three. So uh, if d mod three 
is equal to 0. So that means if it's divisible by 3, then I want to store the value d. So I get the values 0, 3, 6, and 9. Okay. And then you know you could do an if else also. You could say I want d if d is divisible by 2. Okay. Otherwise, else I want d plus 1. Okay. So if it's divisible by 2, I want d. And if it's not divisible by 2, I want d plus 1. Okay. For the values. Uh, from 0 to 9 basically and when we run the list comprehension there it'll go through 0 <coughs> and it'll say oh 0 is divisible by or 0 mod 2 is equal to 0 so so it returns D and then it goes 1 mod 2 is not equal to 0 so it's going to return <coughs> D plus 1 so it returns 2 and then it get goes to 2 2 is divisible by 2 so it returns D to itself and it goes to 3, and it's not divisible, so it returns 3 plus 1, and it returns 4, and, and we get this. Okay, And so that's a, that's a, a list comprehension, and, uh, and it's quite powerful <coughs> in its ability to kind of quickly uh, produce a list without <coughs> having to uh, necessarily write a for loop itself. Okay, and If you're not comfortable with the list comprehension, that's okay. You can always write a for loop. And, um, and iterate over, over all of the things um, you know, in your list or iterable or dictionary or whatever it might be, OK? I mean, we can do um, z is, uh, let's do a dot upper plus uh, exclamation point um, for um, a in ECLA, okay, and what will this return? Um, whoops, print Z, okay, and this will uh, return, you know, it, it just takes each letter because ECLA being a string itself is iterable, and it's going to take each letter in ECLA and return um, capital uh, whatever, you know, whatever this is. Cheer, cheerleader cue cards. So, um, uh, okay. So anyway, these um, I think these are kind of little helpful uh, tools and stuff that uh, that you can use in uh, in Python for um, I don't know <laughs> whatever uh, function uh, writing you need to uh, to accomplish there. Okay. Are there any uh, any questions? I mean, and, and you don't even need to, uh, I think you can throw them into a tuple as well. Oh, oh no, maybe not. Um, you can make a dictionary using a list comprehension. Um, so you can do, um, how do I do this? Do a dot lower colon um, a dot upper or something. This is for a in uh, a b c d e. Okay. <coughs> and this would be I don't know. <laughs> it's a dictionary where the lowercase a course key value is lowercase a corresponds to capital A or something like that. Okay, I mean, it's not a very useful thing, but but you can make dictionaries with uh, list comprehension as well. Okay, uh, we'll end here uh, for today. Uh, I still have to try to figure out setting up your groups to get your um, checkpoints turned in for Friday for the for the data, and then uh, and then we'll see you guys on uh, on Friday. Okay.